So here's how we're doing it, folks. This is Elk Talk Live. We've got Facebook, live stream, Instagram. We are like multitasking. You would swear that we were as talented as our wives to be able to do this much. All right, where are you picking up the volume at? I'm, I'm picking up an echo. Is it on that computer over there? Oh, there we go. All right, folks. Thanks for tuning in to episode 49 of Elk Talk Live. And those of you who've watched this drill before, you knew that we missed last week because it was Independence Day. I hope you all celebrated the freedoms and liberties of being in the greatest country in the world. And if you want to get notified about all this stuff when we go live, because this time of year we're going to start uh, traveling more. I think in August we hit the road, so we're going to be going live on some kind of crazy times. So you're going to want to text Randy to 77453 and you'll get notified at these crazy times that we go live. And I know all of you want to go archery elk hunting in Colorado, fully free, I mean like all expense paid. Go to bowtecharchery.com and sign up. They're giving away... Uh, a Colorado archery elk hunt in September. I think it's the 14th through the 20th. Nate Zielinski is going to take you hunting. Great guy. Uh, includes everything. Airfare, lodging, license, you name it. Um, you got to be 18 years old. And I think they're running that contest through August 10th. So you know that Bowtech's part of this. Leupold is part of this. The greatest optics company. The greatest public land self-guided hunting, all hunting, any hunting supporters that I can think of. Uh, on X Maps, we're doing our e-scouting series with them right now. If you go to our YouTube channel, uh, go to onxmaps.com. We call them OnX for short. Uh, and so right now, then you got to go out to the website because they've got the new thing about how to share way waypoints and stuff like that. And if you want to buy their app, use promo code Randy and you're gonna save yourself 20%. And this week, I went out, got myself all dialed in with the folks at Tight Spot Quivers, Ripcord Arrow Rest, Black Gold Sights. My bow is ready. And then we also, another company that makes this possible, right here, you see that? That's called the Reaper. Get yourself a bugle tube, get yourself a Reaper call from Rocky Mountain Hunting Calls. Go to RockyMountainHuntingCalls.com, use promo code RANDY, get 15% off. And another sponsor, GoHunt.com, sells all these cool Rocky Mountain Hunting Calls out on their gear shop. But they also have this insider service, and right now, you can get a screaming deal. 30 days of the insider, free trial period, 30 days, you get to see behind the scenes. All the stuff that we use. Just go to gohunt.com forward slash, I think it's Randy. No, insider slash Randy. I should know that. Anyhow, I don't need to get credit for it. Just make sure you get the 30-day free trial from gohunt.com. Um, all right. So today, what are we going to talk about? We're going to talk about camps. BV camp versus base camp. Where do I set my camp? Why do I choose one over the other? Are there certain factors that cause me to do it this way or that way? Um, but before we get into that, if you are an Amazon Prime subscriber, two new Amazon episodes went up in the last week. One of them is under Fresh Tracks Films and one of them is under Fresh Tracks Season 6. So we have two different platforms out there. Fresh Tracks Films has this wilderness elk hunt in Arizona called Uncommon Ground. Go watch that one. And then season six, it looks like Amazon got on the ball. They're starting to approve some episodes for us. Uh, the Montana Moose Hunt just got approved yesterday or the day before out on Amazon. So we got two new Amazon episodes for you to watch. Uh, and on Friday, if you were listening to anything in the, the uh, elk hunting world, you know that myself and Corey Jacobson started a new podcast. Sounds very similar to what we're doing here, right? That podcast is called The Elk Talk Podcast, just like Elk Talk Live. So go to elktalkpodcast.com and sign up or follow us on Instagram with the little curly Q at sign, Elk Talk Podcast. So 
got all those things out of the way and uh, before we jump into uh, talking about these uh, camps, bivy camps versus base camps, uh, well, I'm gonna check a few questions here, make sure that everybody's still paying attention and they don't think that I've uh, forgot about them. I'm trying to figure out uh, eeny, meeny, miny, mo if I should do Instagram questions or if I should do Facebook questions or live stream. Dan's over there sending me the live stream questions here on a Google Doc. Uh, I got the, the Facebook ones here and I got the Instagram ones here. Holy cow, there's a lot of people following right now. Whoo! Uh, all right, someone says, I found the perfect, uh, they say, I found the perfect secluded limited access BLM land. However, I cannot hunt it because there's no corner crossing. What's up with no corner crossing in Montana? Never heard of it. Well, think about it. And I know some people are going to like this answer. So I'm going to show you what corner crossing means. Okay, let's say two pieces come together at a perfect corner like that. Actually, four pieces do. Think of a checkerboard. This is right here is all private. This, is, this piece is public. This piece up here is public, but this piece down here is private. The person is saying, I want to go from this piece over to this piece. And I want to jump at the corner. Well, under every state's law, that is considered trespass of the civil variety. It may not be criminal trespass, but it is civil trespass. I know some of you are saying, well, I just stepped over this minute section, this itty bitty microscopic corner of, the, of their land. I know, but under civil law, that's considered civil trespass. So, and in Montana, a lot of our counties will prosecute that as also being criminal trespass. So there's two types of trespass, criminal and civil. No matter where you're at, you're, you're gonna be committing civil trespass. You may or may not be committing criminal trespass. So that's just how it goes. I, that's the answer to the question. Um, uh, let's see. <laughs> Any of you who can should be watching our e-scouting series with the OnX folks out on our map, uh, on our map, on our YouTube channel. Every Monday we re release a new video, and uh, uh, the feedback so far is really, really good. I think we're in the first week. Uh, each video gets like twelve to fifteen thousand views, and a lot of the stuff that we're covering here is also stuff that we cover there, but there we cover it in way more depth than what we do here. So, all right, I'm gonna take one of these. Let's see. Oh man, these are these are going by so fast on this itty bitty phone. How do you, how do you guys, so this is Dan's iPhone. I got a great big droid over there. I don't know how you people can read this stuff on these itty bitty phones. Uh, here we go. So, someone says, love the e-scouting. Will cows stay in the same area in, instead of bulls come mid-October? So, yeah, that's, we, Dan and I reshot that video that answers that question. We reshot it twice because it was such a complicated way for me to explain it. I called him yesterday and said, Dan, we got to reshoot that one. I didn't answer that one very well. So, here's some things to think about. And it's going to come out in the video where we do the planning for, what was that, Dan, a pre-rut hunt when yep. we talked about that? So think about this. In a pre-rut season, both the, the bulls and the cows are on a food pattern, but the cows are feeding in a different place than the bulls. The bulls might be feeding higher up or further from roads or whatever, but they're both interested in food. As the pre-rut converts to rut, you end up with the bulls now getting closer to the cows. So even though they're both on a feed pattern late August, early September, they may not necessarily be together. Yeah, the, the younger bulls will probably be in with the cows. The older bulls, they'll come and check on the cows and as the, uh, the rut gets closer, so as the pre-rut period continues from the 1st of September to the 8th to the 9th and we're chugging along. And now, yeah, they're mixed up by the time the pre-rut is there. Then to this person's question, after the pre-rut goes to rut, and then in mid-October when we get into post-rut, will the bulls move or will the cows move? The bulls are gonna move. 
The bulls are going to go back into sanctuary areas. Depending on weather, the cows might start moving closer to the winter range, leaving the summer range. So there's summer range, winter range, and then there's usually transition range, at least in alpine environments. They're never just, oh, okay, I'm in summer range, and tomorrow I'm going to be on the winter range. There's these transition ranges, and there's places along those transition ranges that they will stage. And they'll stage based on food availability, whether it's a drought year, a wet year, hunting pressure, all kinds of things. So, the, but once October comes, mid-October, and we're back to a pre-rut where sanctuary is the number one need, the bulls are going to move, the cows are probably going to stay nearby. They're going to stay in their same patterns, feeding where the best food on the mountain is, just like they were in the, in the peak rut. But the bulls are going to drift off, at least the mature bulls. So a lot of times when I answer these questions, I'm referring to what the mature bulls, public land bulls, are doing. The year and a half, two and a half year old bulls, a lot of times will just stay and mingle with the cows. They haven't been shot at yet. They don't know any better. So uh, hopefully that answers that question. Um, <laughs> someone says, Randy, would you mind helping me out by taking a look at a place on Onyx? You know, it's funny, since we started this e-scouting series, I bet you I've had 40 to 50 emails a week, people asking, if I send you this screenshot or these maps, will you tell me? No, I, I won't. I'm sorry for a couple of reasons. One, I don't have time. But two, that's the whole process we're going through here is to teach, well, not teach, to at least explain how I do it. Teach implies that there's a right way or a wrong way. Uh, so the whole process we're going through is to let people know, you know what, this is how I do it. So for me to go and say, well, I do this, I do that, you really haven't invested in yourself in the learning process. So I'm, I'm just telling those people, hey, great, but I'm, I'm not able to do it. Thanks for watching. And, and I hope people understand uh, why that's the case, but it is how it is. You shooting me some over on the live stream, Dan? Yeah, a couple. Of okay. Uh, any recommendations on a rangefinder? Yeah, go to Leopold.com and check out the new rangefinders. They have a 1600 and a 2500. You're going to want one of those. That's the easy answer. Trust me on that. Last week or the or last episode or the episode before, I went into this long discussion about how sometimes these cheaper rangefinders that don't invest in the good sensors, don't invest in the technology to really get them dialed in. Sometimes you get what you pay for. Uh, you won't have that problem with the Leopold rangefinder. So I would go out there and find where you can order one, go to any of the good retailers that carry the gold ring stuff, and you'll be set. Uh, let's see. So someone says, elk behavior in the West doesn't pertain here in New Mexico. Hard to pattern these animals here. Hmm. I, I've hunted New Mexico a lot, and uh, I've, I've, they have their same seasonal patterns. They may not do the high alpine to, to, to low winter range, but they still have changes in their behaviors across the landscape based on the time of year. And drought years, like I know you guys in New Mexico right now are having a terrible drought year. Um, that really amplifies some of these changes and concentrates elk in more sp in tighter spots. So they're, they're not as dispersed across the landscape, so they're a little bit harder to find. But when you do find them, they're usually in higher densities in these drought years. So, all right, someone's asking a question here that I'm gonna just tell them. It says, you, you can get this answer by going to the video we just released on Monday called Burns, it's part three. How soon will you hunt after a burn? I have a late season tag, November 10th through the 18th. There was a section on my hunt that was on fire the 1st of June. Go watch that video and you'll find out that the answer is maybe. It depends. <laughs> but that, that video will tell you why the answer is maybe. Um, so, do you need standing water or will the elk drink out of a creek? I've seen them drink out of lots of little creeks and seeps and springs. Um, I've seen them drinking out of rivers. Uh, I, I don't know that yet you need to have standing water. Um, do I feel that elk get very nocturnal? Um, in really hot weather, I mean, I, I hear this nocturnal thing a lot with whitetail hunters. Oh man, they went nocturnal on me. And I think what that means is, for whatever reason, moon phase or 
temperatures or whatever, the, the deer were doing most of their activity at night. Well, elk, I've found, anyhow, in my experience, if it's super hot, they're not going to be very active during the day, but the rut is still going on, right? It's September 14th or September 20th. They got to do the rutting. It's the estrus cycle. But most of that's happening at night. And when people say that elk went nocturnal, it's usually a function of how warm it is. And elk just can't be out there exerting themselves that heavily when it's that hot. So I, I don't see them going quote unquote nocturnal to hunting pressure as much as I see them doing most of their activity at night because of temperatures. So, oh, let's see, do we wanna get into camps? How do you work your way through thick country without spooking the animals? I don't think I do. What I mean by that is I think I spook them. And when it's thick, nasty country and, and elk, Remember, they hear a lot of noise. They make a lot of noise. I, noise is probably the one thing I'm least concerned about with elk when I'm trying to get somewhere. They, if you ever heard elk walking through the woods, they make a lot of noise. If you, you know, they, they're around moose, they're around bears, they're around other critters that make a lot of noise. So I don't worry that much about noise. If I'm going from this ridge to that ridge, I'm just getting there. And now wind, I'll worry about that. But noise, not so much. Uh, let's see. Man, I'm sorry, folks. I can't get to all of these. <laughs> this is crazy. Uh, Brochier says, hi, Randy. Hi, Michael. Hi, Marcus. Hi, Dan. Hi. How are you doing? Thanks for being here. Uh, what is that? Do elk stay away from wild horses? Uh, it's my experience that I've seen them together in Nevada and Utah. Uh, where else? In Colorado, I've seen them together. I, I think they would prefer to be somewhat apart. Um, uh, wild horses are aggressive, ornery, miserable, feral creatures that need to be controlled and moved off the landscape in my mind. But uh, I... I've seen them together, but I think elk prefer to be away from them. Let's put it that way. How do I get the burn layer? David Powers asked this. You go to onyxmaps.com, buy the app, and you'll look. There's state layers and national layers. One of the national layers just below the logging and timber layer is the old, fi the historic fire layer. Click on it, it'll show up. And use promo code Randy to save yourself 20% when you buy that app. Uh, let's see. <laughs> so, so, some of you guys have some really funny questions here. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's right. I, I might not. Some of you people are trying to really make me. I, I would almost blush if I if I answered some of those. Uh, Randy, you talked about rangefinders. Will some of those nicer rangefinders work in the rain and the mild fog? Yes, the, the better ones will. So, uh, what kind of Kenetrek boots do I wear? I have Mountain Extreme non insulated, and I just went and picked up a pair of Mountain Guides. Uh, very, very good. Um, all right, Pat wants to know discuss your opinion on hunting the full moon for elk. I usually avoid it. You? We get asked this question a lot. Uh, in our Elk Talk podcast that Corey and I are doing, we're going to get into a whole session about moon phases. Uh, Corey and I have, I, I think, somewhat similar, but a, a bit of variation in our perspective on moon phases. For me, I just have to go and hunt because I'm going from this hunt to that hunt to this hunt to that hunt. And I I draw the tag, got to film it, got the film permit, got the crew lined up. We just got to be there, whether it's a full moon a half moon, a, a new moon, whatever. Uh, I can't say that I have ever noticed any big difference that elk just decide to quit doing whatever. I do notice that they do have, to some degree, and it, when I say this happens, it, it's amplified more when it's hot. You do see a little bit more activity at night and less activity during the day. And the warmer it is in a full moon phase, the more you see that happening. Um, but as far as them just, oh, it's full moon, so I'm going to just 
go lay down for the next five days. I, I don't see that. I've, I've never seen that. In fact, the biggest bull I've ever killed in my life with a bow, I killed the day after the peak full moon. So I guess because I was just out there doing it. <laughs> so, uh, do you have any recommendations on books, biologies or tactics related? Uh, I'm all about biology, ecology. Uh, and I've said this many times on this and other platforms, Jack Ward Thomas has the best book out there, uh, Elk and Elk Ecology. Uh, go out, Google, do a Google search and say Starkey Experimental Forest Elk. The Starkey Experimental Forest has some of the best elk information about biology, food preferences. They have their own elk herd there that they can go and observe and collar and test and experiment with. It's amazing information. It's very scientific reading. It'll almost put you to sleep if you're really not dialed into wanting to know about elk, but it's really, really good stuff. So, uh, doo -doo -doo. how far do I typically go from a road in a rifle bull hunt? Uh, hunting October in New Mexico, Unit 45. Uh, usually rifle hunts that I have are in the post rut or in the late season. So I'm usually anywhere from one to four miles away from a road. And then I hike back anywhere from one to four miles. Uh, because, and, and the reason that is, is in those periods, sanctuary is the number one need that elk have in the post rut and in the late season. So to get to the sanctuaries, usually, not always, but usually you got to get a pretty good distance from a road. Have you ever hunted Unit 8 in Arizona? Yes. If so, would you rate the terrain difficulty? How would I rate it? I drew my first bull elk tag that starts November 30th. It depends on what part of the unit you're going to hunt. If you go out to the south end down by Sy Sycamore Canyon and that, it is as bad and nasty as any place you're going to find in the lower 48. You're going to walk up to those finger canyons going down into Sycamore Canyon and you're going to say, I don't want to shoot an elk there. That's a sanctuary. There you go. But even I look at that stuff down into the Sycamore Canyon, I'm like, I'm not shooting an elk down there. Uh, expect a lot of hunting pressure. Um, and in places like Arizona where, ha where they have these short seasons, have your first day plan. Go there and scout one to two to three days in advance. Find some elk and know what they're doing. Know where they're hanging out because they've already had an early archery season in September. They probably had maybe one of the muzzleloader seasons. The unit eight sometimes has a middle rifle season. Sometimes it has a cow season. So these elk have had a lot of pressure and even not just unit eight, but across a lot of these units in the West. I have my opening day plan and then I have my rest of the hunt plan. My opening day plan is I'm scouting, days one, two, and three of scouting. I'm trying to find elk, all right? If I find them there in the morning, do I find them there the next morning? Are they in a pattern where that morning I can go there and count that on opening morning when it becomes legal shooting light, they are still there, I'm gonna fill my tag. Once the shooting starts, the whole game, the deck gets reshuffled. So have your plan November 30th figured out, this is what I'm gonna be doing opening morning. And then be thinking about, all right, after opening day on December 1st through whatever the rest of the season is, have a plan for that also. And it's probably going to be a different plan. The elk are going to move into even more, I guess, canyon, terrible, nasty, ugly, brushy sanctuary places. So, uh, poo -poo. any advice for aspen forest elk hunting? Uh, that's a vague question and the reason I, I'm, I brought it up here is it would depend. Are you in August? Are you in the pre-rut of early September? Are you in the peak rut? Are you in a post rut? Or are you in a late season? The, the answer would depend on which of those seasons you're talking about. So, uh, do I ever use dry ice? Yeah, once in a while I do. Um, I I have these really, really good Orion coolers, so I, I really don't even need dry ice, really, once my meat gets cooled. So, oh, Tim asks, how far do I think elk will move from a fire and how soon would you hunt the burn? Um, obviously, that, you know, Colorado right now is having some really, really tough 
uh, fires. And the if they're really big fires, high intensity fires, elk will move quite a ways away. We're talking, uh, they'll move three, four, five, maybe even more miles away to get away from that fire. If it's a small fire, they'll just live around it and, and make their way around it. If if it's a really high intensity burn, those elk might not be back into that burn area for another year or two. So it's, uh, it depends, but you know, a fire usually never just burns a perfect line. It usually zigzags and does a, you know, a little jog in here and da, da, da. In those fringe areas that create these irregular shapes to the, the outline of the fire, elk will be back in those places earlier, like maybe even this year, if you get some moisture. <clears throat> oh, let's see. Doo -doo. <laughs> uh, yeah. Have I hunted any Navajo Nation lands? No, I've not. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's see. We got more, Dan? You know, I'm still yeah. not. I got uh, a good one. Okay, is it on your list here? Okay, did the I see the bottom one? Okay, all right. This one could be quite an answer. I got asked it today by uh, a person doing an interview for uh, a film. Uh, what's the best way to talk to someone about hunting and conservation? That depends. I, <laughs> I try to sort of weed them out. Of, is this somebody who's just like rabid, crazy, anti-hunting, blinders on? I just want to argue I'm never going to listen. The best way to, to, to talk to them is to not talk to them. Now you got a whole bunch of other people who are seriously, genuinely interested and curious about it. Um, so here, here's the rest of Dylan's question is, I shot a spring bear and I've had my butt handed to me by a few people that disagree with shooting bears, but not deer or elk. You know what? You, you, you hunt deer, or elk, or bears for the same reason, right? We're going to eat them, we're going to do whatever with them, we're going to use as much of them as we can. It's just that some people have a different perspective about warm and fuzzy things that they think somehow are almost humanized. We're talking bears, we're talking lions, we're talking wolves, stuff like that. Um, the best way to talk to those people is to just be matter of fact about it. Um, Explain why you do it. Don't try to be something you're not. Uh, don't try to discount their uh, feelings about it because the, the one thing that you have in common with that person is you both have a concern for wild, a wild animals and the wild places they live. So you have that starting point of commonality, but they just have a different view of it. Don't think that you gotta change someone's mind today. You'll change their mind by your actions, your behavior, and how you conduct yourself over time more than you will get in an argument with them at a cocktail party. So I don't, I don't worry too much about it. Uh, let's see. Hey Randy, what personal camera do you use for pictures? Do you use a Sony a6000? We have a Sony a6000, a 6300 and Marcus has a 6500. Those mirrorless cameras are really, really good. Uh, I don't know if I have it here. No, I don't have it with me. We've also found a little mic setup that works really good with those mirrorless cameras. So Sony's mirrorless cameras are the top notch. That's why we have three of them amongst our crew. We, we can use them for great video, really, really good video. I mean like this real cinematic effect. And then switch it over to photo and we're taking all of our landscape images, all of our camp photos, all that. Probably the most versatile uh, setup that we have in our arsenal. Mm. Let's see, what's the best way to keep meat fresh in the heat? Get it cooled off really quick, use really good uh, game bags. I use the caribou game bags, they're made in a company in Colorado. Uh, Ted, if you're watching this, you make the best game bags out there. Um, uh, just get the meat cooled off. That's the number one key. And then keep it cool once you get it cooled off. Hey Dan, on these uh, iPhones, do you scroll up or do you scroll down? Uh, I, they're, they're, should go up. 
What's that? Put, scroll your thumb upwards. To get the newest? Yeah. All right. Sorry, folks. I'm like low tech, man. If, if there was a hospice facility for technology, I would be in that hospice facility. Trust me on that. Are you planning, Randy, Brian asks, are you planning to any hunting in Wyoming this year? Yes, I have a pronghorn tag. Uh, Marcus has a pronghorn tag. And my son Matthew and my Uncle Larry have really, really good elk tags. So looking forward to that. Um, let's see. I'm trying to switch this around, folks. So if I'm missing some of you, uh, I, I apologize about that. Are the Kennetrek mountain guides a tougher boot than the mountain extremes uh it's a it's a firmer boot it's got a little firmer sole you'll know it right away when you put it on it doesn't have quite the flexibility of the mountain extreme but the mountain guide is more for rock for steep alpine for sheep hunting stuff like that so there's a difference and you just want to make sure you got the right one hey marcus is watching you know what he did he he's chimed in to say that the the uh uh, little microphone I was telling you about for the Sony A6000, 6300, 6500. It's a Rode Video Micro. R-O-D-E, Rode. Isn't that how it's pronounced? Or is it called, pronounced Rode? Anyhow, thanks, Marcus. Rescued the day. Um, <laughs> have I hunted Eastern Oregon? I have not. Um, someday I will. Uh, if my guys, my buddies over at Born and Raised Outdoors don't give up on me, I'm going over there. I, I've already kind of eased myself into their August 2019 Roosevelt camp. Uh, I, <laughs> I don't know. Maybe, <laughs> maybe they're going to say, no, you haven't, Newberg. You should, you're talking about it. We haven't invited you yet. Uh, <laughs> uh, let's see. How's the walleye fishing been? Uh, well, I don't get to do enough of it. I've been doing some, and when I went, it's good, but I could always do more of it. Uh, are the wildfires in Colorado impact, impacting my fall hunts? Not my fall hunts, but a lot of people. A lot of people have been emailing me saying, man, what would you do if you were in my situation? Uh, I'd play it by ear. Colorado, you're allowed to turn your tag back in. If my area got torched, I mean like really big and they get no rain in July or August, I might be turning that tag back in, getting my points and going next year. So, uh, let's see. Can I explain what I call a drainage? Uh, sure, because I get that question a lot. A drainage is where a creek drains, right? So you got topography, you got maybe this basin up here that's higher country and it goes back and it forms, it, it connects back there and all the water drains down into one place. So a drainage, when you say that, it's kind of like a basin area that all of the, the water from that area drains into that one little canyon or draw or drainage as we call them. Uh, a lot of people ask us, and, and I think we out west, we use terms like tank, uh, saddle, drainage, uh, you know, all kinds of these terms. I think someday I should probably do a, a YouTube video about what all these crazy terms mean. Uh, so, Lamb says, love your podcast. Thank you. Uh, huge fan. There are recent fires that are a third of my unit, Unit 16D in New Mexico. Ooh, lucky you. How will this affect elk in the area? Well, uh, we just answered a similar question to that. It'll slightly displace them, but you guys in New Mexico get a lot of monsoon rain, so if you get good monsoon rain in June, July, they'll start, or I mean in July and August, they'll start moving back towards there. They may not move into the middle of the burn, but they'll start moving and feeding around the fringe of the burn. So, oh, let's see. I got to get to these questions I have from, uh, these are questions that came about from the e-scouting episodes that we did. And uh, we really try to get into this in more depth. And it's about camp selection. We've had a lot of questions on this Elk Talk Live uh, platform over the last year about do we do bivy camp or base camp? If you do, when do you do it? Where and how and all this stuff. So uh, the new Elk Talk podcast that I'm doing with Corey Jacobson, Corey and I were talking today and 
we're comparing notes of what we got from feedback from the first episode, which was released last Friday, the 6th. The second episode, we'll get into a lot more. The first episode is kind of telling everyone, all right, here's what we do and this is what it's about. The next episode on the 20th is going to be all business. Um, but we were comparing notes and we both had on our notes that a lot of people were asking us questions and want us to talk more about camp selection. So here we go. Uh, to me, you really have two options, a bivy camp, spike camp, whatever you want to call it, which is kind of a camp you're going to put on your back or a base camp. And I can't say that I do one over the other because I'm going to do whatever one gives me the best options based on the e-scouting plan that I put together. So I'll, I'll try to explain what I mean by that. In my e-scouting plans, and you're going to see these as, as we put them together, uh, we just did the pre-rut e-scouting plan, that video. Uh, is it tomorrow, Dan, we're going to try to get the post-rut one or are we doing that next week? Anyhow, okay. So. You'll see how we do this. And I try to give myself options. And I'm looking for certain features. And if all of the features I'm looking for are clustered in one small area, I might go into that area and do a bivy camp and know that, you know what, I, this, is, this has the highest density of my waypoints that indicate this or indicate that. Now, some of my e-scouting plans end up with kind of a cluster over here and a little cluster of those aspects or traits over here and a little cluster down here. Then I'm going to do a base camp and I'm going to try to be somewhere five miles or 15 or 20 minutes at the max from all three of these little clusters of where I've identified features I want to look for. So I would say as a general rule, um, I'm going to do a base camp when I'm in a new area because my first one, two, three days of my hunt are gonna be as much scouting as they are hunting. So I want a base camp where I can go check out this area. And then tomorrow I'll go check out this area. And this afternoon I'll go check out that area. If I do a bivy camp, I'm kind of putting my stake in the ground and saying, I'm going way back in here and that's it. On foot, I can't do nearly as much scouting. I can't cover as much difference in elevation or in vegetation or whatever. So in a new area, I'm usually gonna do a base camp. Archery, I'm usually gonna do a base camp. And some of you are probably like, well, why is that? And for me, in the archery seasons of pre-rut and peak rut, elk are very mobile. They're moving across the landscape. I mean, they'll, they'll go motoring through this little thinned out area, they'll get over in that basin, they'll be over there feeding, they'll come down here and water and they'll move. Elk can move a lot in the rut. So I want to be as mobile so I can follow them. And when they're moving across the landscape, I got to be moving across the landscape. And a base camp gives me that flexibility to do that. Uh, kind of the flip side of that is if there are places where I tend to use a bivy camp more than a base camp, it would be usually in a rifle season when I know that the elk are in heavy sanctuary mode, usually late, uh, uh, pre, pre, uh, post rut or late season. And sometimes that bivy camp might not be a full backpack hunt, uh, camp, but it'll be way back somewhere that maybe I just about almost ruined my truck getting in there. Uh, I know I got to deal with some nasty roads or whatever. I'm not going to have a lot of competition getting back in there. Uh, and I'm just going to hunt one small area. And the reason that is, is because when bulls are in sanctuary mode, they're not going to be as mobile. They're not going to be moving across the landscape like they are in the rut, and like pre-rut or peak rut. So I know for sure I'm going to be hunting further from roads and trails during a sanctuary period of post-rut or late season. Another time when I will use a, a bivy camp more is if it's an area I'm familiar with. Maybe it's a spot I've hunted many times. I find that I end up doing more bivy camps in Montana than I do in other states because the places I hunt in Montana, I've already hunted there before. I know what the elk are going to do. I've done, I, my prior years of hunting are kind of my scouting time. I know the animal's behavior. I know how they use the landscape. I know how they're going to respond to hunting pressure. So there's less risk of me going way back in and doing a bivy camp and know that, all right, I'm only got two miles that way, two miles that way, or two miles this way. That's, that's less of a risk if it's a place I'm really familiar with. 
Um, I'd say as a general concept, a bivy camp is a high risk, high reward situation. If you spend a whole day getting in there and you get in there and it's not what you thought, or you get in there and three other guys are already in there and you're going to be hunting right on top of each other, there's a lot of risk with that. But if you go in there and no one's in there and it's exactly what you thought it would be, there could be a lot of reward in there. So you really got to decide, do I want to take the risk and deal with whatever that risk might give me, either a big reward or a big goose egg? It's up to you. Base camps, they probably give you, well, they do give you way more mobility if you're moving across the unit and they allow you to be more adaptable. You know, I, I'm not going to lose a whole day moving to another unit if I'm at a base camp. I'll just get in my truck, I'll drive over to that trailhead and hike in that afternoon. Or if I say that didn't work and the next morning I want to go over here, it's not like I got to pull a camp, hike five miles and walk in someplace another five miles and set another camp. So the adaptability aspects of uh, a base camp are pretty nice. Um, so, and as you get older, you like some of the comforts that you can have in a base camp also. And with our production gear, uh, that probably tends to push us more over to base camps and less towards bivy camps. But with our friend Bo at Wilderness Ridge Trail Llamas, uh, we, we've solved a little bit of the complication of getting old. Um, speaking of which, Wilderness Ridge Trail Llamas, they just, uh, Bo and Kirsten, have a YouTube channel that we've been kind of doing some episodes for them. So go give them a like, subscribe to their channel, and you will learn more about llamas, more about what kind of animals they are, how you can use them for elk hunting, uh, and they're great people. So, Randy, do you ever get time off from working? Do you get overtime pay? <laughs> oh, man. My wife and I were just talking about that before I came here today. She's like, you know... I would like to do something with you in one of the 365 days in a year. I'm like, ooh, ooh, yeah. Uh, no, when you're self-employed, you don't get paid overtime. You don't get paid vacation. None of that stuff. Ah, uh, Corey Stickler. How you doing, Corey? You must not be at the mine. Uh, Corey's my cousin. Uh, he probably doesn't admit that to many people. Uh, have I ever hunted the Weminucci? Uh, that must, I think that's a unit over in Oregon. I, I can't even pronounce it right. No, I've not. Uh, so, sorry about that. I'm, I'm of no help. Uh, what's my favorite pack to carry when I'm elk hunting? 99% uh, of the time, I'm going to be using my Mystery Ranch Metcalf. It's a great day pack. Flattens right out. Expands. And if you go to GoHunt.com, sign up for the Insider, you get $50 of free store credit when you use promo code Randy you can use that towards your Metcalf that you can buy from the gear shop over at GoHunt.com. Um, let's see. <laughs> Someone says, with all these fires, I'm almost happy for once that I did not, <laughs> that I didn't draw Colorado. You know, I've heard quite a few people say that this year. I've not been down to Colorado. I won't be down through there until September. Uh, but reading the reports and knowing some really serious hunters there, I feel bad for the fires that they're having. Um, oh, let's see. Do you only take mature bull elk? Never seen you take a cow or a calf. Heard they taste better. You know what? Uh, I take whatever is legal. When a camera guy says it's good footage, good story, good whatever, I'm doing it. I mean, the smallest bull I've ever shot, we shot on film in Colorado. And a lot of people were like, didn't you see that nice six point standing back there? Yeah, but this one was right here close. He gave me a better shot. So that's the one I took. In Wyoming one year, there's a really nice six point bedded and there's a smaller five by six standing there. I mean, like significantly smaller. And I asked the camera guy, I'm like, what, what's the footage? He's like, that one standing there is perfect. Boom. So I, if I had a cow tag, I, I wouldn't hesitate to do the same thing. So no, I'm, I'm a kind of elk speed, uh, elk SX agnostic. In other words, I don't, 
I don't really care if they're male or female, antlered or antlerless, whatever my tag is for. If the camera guy gives me the thumbs up and it's really good footage and we've got a good story building up to it, odds are I'm going to fill that tag. Or I'm at least going to shoot. Uh, <laughs> uh, wow, a lot of people listen to the podcast with Corey. I'm glad to hear that. Uh, <clears throat> what's this one say? Uh, would you rather hunt elk in a movement corridor that is relatively easy to access or would you rather hunt a place that is just harder to access? It depends on the season, but if it's a rifle hunt, I'm going to go into those harder to access places because I know the elk are in sanctuary mode. Archery season, mm, maybe not so much. I, I don't worry about it as much in uh, archery season as I do in the, the later seasons. Hey, Randy, when can we look forward to more Fresh Tracks episodes? You, uh, uh, Hawk, Yodi, Hunter, uh, we answered that right away at the early part of this. There's two new episodes up on Amazon. Go to the, our Amazon channel. Randy Newberg, uh, uh, Fresh Tracks with Randy Newberg, Season 6, has a new Montana moose hunt in it. And then search for Fresh Tracks films. So they Amazon makes you put them in different places, unfortunately. So Fresh Track Films, we have an Arizona wilderness elk hunt called Uncommon Ground. So hopefully that helps. A uh, lot of uh, examples here of people asking the specific this or specific that. And on these uh, questions, it's really hard to answer super specific questions because it's, it just depends on so many things. Um, so, Andrew says, the Arizona monsoon is in full swing. I hope so. I hope Arizona, New Mexico, Nevada, Utah, Colorado, I hope you guys get drenched. You guys need it. In fact, we've got enough rain up here this summer. We'll send you some. Mm -hmm. Uh-oh, there was a question there. <clears throat> All right. Randy, what should I look for on Onyx Maps when looking for elk in the early season? So, early season is August. They're on the food. Food, food, food. So you need to know what their food source is in the unit you're hunting. Because what they're eating as food in areas in Montana in August are different than what their food sources are in the high alpine of Colorado or on the Gila of New Mexico or in some of the isolated mountain ranges of Nevada. So you need to know what the food source is during the time you're hunting, which is going to be mostly grasses and forbs. So early August in Onyx, you're looking for where's the best food. And doing your research about what elk prefer for forage is what's going to lead you to what the best food is. And you're going to be able to see that on Onyx. You'll, you'll know what kind of environment those best foods of grasses grow in. And Onyx will show you what that looks like through the aerial view, through all the water sources, through north slopes, east slopes, what, whatever the characteristics on the landscape will produce the quality food that the elk are seeking. So it's all about food in the early season. <clears throat> Do I normally like to camp above or below elk and hike up early when backpacking in? I always camp below the elk. Uh, just because... If you think about it, in the morning, you got a downwind thermal, okay, downslope thermal. If I'm below, I'm hiking in in the dark with that in my face. So I'm going to always be doing that. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so you guys have some really funny things here. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Randy, what's your process for figuring out the food sources in a new area you're hunting? We talked about that in the video we shot yesterday. Google is your friend. And so in this e-scouting, we're already getting some comments where people are like, well, tell me what they eat here. Tell me what they eat there. Tell me what their food is. No, that's up to you. You got to go and Google elk forage, Gila National Forest, elk forage studies, Wyoming range. Elk forage study, Missouri breaks. You need to do your own research about what the elk prefer to eat in the area you're going to be hunting. And none of that is just, oh, it's the same. I, I found them eating this grass in Montana, so they eat that grass everywhere. No. One of the t reasons I spend so much time doing research 
especially if I'm hunting a period when food is critical, is I know that the food that they're going to be preferring at the time I'm there is going to be different across the western landscape. And I just, I Google them. There, there's so much information out there about what elk prefer to eat on the Al Gore's internet. It's crazy how much is there. So that's how I solve that issue. Uh, <laughs> Bob Denny. Bob, how are you? Do you use or trust the Montana Harvest Statistics on the Fish and Game website? Um, I don't know. They have better data than I have. Uh, would you let these numbers influence your unit selection for a general September elk hunt? Um, yeah, it's, I mean, it may not be perfect, but it's going to be better data than what's out, than what I can get anywhere else. So I'm going to use it. Uh, and it's going to direct me, okay? The harvest is this. The number of days per bull taken is this. That's good information to know. I have, if it's 30 days per bull taken, I'm not hunting there. If it's four days per bull taken, I'm probably hunting there. Mm -hmm. Let's see. <clears throat> Early season, the primary need for both bulls and cows is feed. You got that right, Riley. I'm only finding cows. How far away are the bulls? It depends, but... The, uh, earlier, I was talking about how when they're both on a feed pattern, the cows prefer this type of food. The bulls will make a living on a different type of food that occurs on a different spot on the landscape. The, in the early season, the bulls are bachelored up and they are usually in herds some far distance. Uh, how far of a distance? You can't really say. It depends on how the food patterns are. But what you're seeing is very common where you'll see a lot of cows, say, down low. In the Rockies, this is very classic. You'll see a lot of cows at 7,000 feet. The bulls are up at 8,500. Or you're seeing cows in Colorado at, you know, 10,5. The bulls are up at 11,5. It just depends on where you're at in the West and what the preferred food sources are. Know that the cows will always select for the best, absolute best food source on the landscape. They know it, they figured it out thousands and thousands of years ago. They, they just know it. The bulls are willing to deal with maybe a little bit lesser of, a, of, a, of quality in the food source, but they're still on a food pattern. And they might only be a half mile away, they might be four miles away. So I, I know a lot of you are like, Randy, every question you answer, you say, it depends. Yeah, it depends. <laughs> and uh, requires some knowledge and, and thinking about it. Uh, the number one thing you can do is read just everything you can find about elk and elk ecology. Read it, read it, read it. That's going to make you a way, way more informed hunter. I, I feel like I know like one little iota of elk ecology. I talk to some people who know so much about that stuff, and I'm sure they get tired of me asking them questions, but... Man, some of them are just like really, really knowledgeable. And I'm thankful for anything they're willing to share for me, share with me. And even if that means they, a lot of them will say, go read this book or go read that study, I'll go do it. Uh, <laughs> if you stole this laptop, if someone steals this laptop, the number of elk research articles that are on this hard drive are pretty significant. Uh, you got anything over there, Dan, that I'm missing on the live stream that I just got to get to or the world's going to hate me? Um, <clears throat> when there is lush green grass and vegetation absolutely everywhere, how do you find where the elk are? All right. So we as humans look at it and say, wow, look at all this lush green grass. For elk, they know that those grasses over there are different than these grasses are different than those forbs are different from these, blah, blah, blah. You have to let the elk tell you and your research tell you. Just because it's green doesn't mean elk like it. There's a lot of invasive plant species that have zero nutritional value that are green. That gets back to doing your research, getting on the computer and finding out 
What do elk use as their preferred forage in September? Okay, when that dries up, what do they switch to as their preferred forage in late October? Okay, when that gets buried with snow, what do they, what do, they do then in November? They're doing something different all the time. As far as when I say all the time, I mean across the calendar period. So you, that just requires research, research, research. A lot of reading involved. Uh, where do you find research on elk or whitetail or anything else for that matter? Your state game agencies, your universities, uh, a lot of the nonprofit groups, the Wildlife Society. The Wildlife Society in the United States is the society of all of our, all of our biologists. They put out such unbelievable papers. If you aren't re following and if you haven't bookmarked the Wildlife Society page, you're missing out on a ton of information. So I don't care what species it is. It can be ducks. There's amazing stuff that's being put out there. The, the Forest Service, the BLM, they have biologists that are putting out great studies, great information. So it's, it's all about, for me anyhow, I, I got to spend so much time investing in myself because that's really the only way I'm gonna gain any knowledge is just, all right, I gotta go read this. I gotta go find that out. I gotta ask myself the question, why are they all over here when the whole landscape looks green? That looks green, but every night they're over here. Well, I go over there and I find out, you know what? That's green, but it's different than what's green over here. And that's what they like this time of year. So uh, that comes from reading, comes from experience, comes from boots on the ground a lot of times also. Mm, let's see, someone just asked that one. <clears throat> uh, dude, iron your shirt. No way, man. This is a Duluth Trading Company. Uh, what's it called, the Armachillo shirt? You don't iron these things. These are like hot weather shirts. Lay off, man, you guys are a hard crowd here. I'm not ironing my shirt. Okay. <laughs> oh, no. Oh. Uh-oh. Someone says, I just saw your moose hunt on Amazon. I like those Leopold binoculars you were using. They were a prototype, and I wasn't supposed to have them on the footage. Oops. I'm going to get in trouble for that. But I did hide them, didn't I? I hit them really good. They're beautiful. They're wonderful binoculars. They're not available yet, though. Dang it. You guys, you guys pick up on everything. You pick up on the fact that you think my shirt isn't iron. You, you pick up on the prototype binos I'm using. Wait till you see... All right, everyone's asking me what rifle I'm using this year. Tomorrow we're going to shoot a video that kind of lets a cat out of the bag. I'm, I'm, this is like, 2018 has been Randy's year of experiment with rifles. Hawa and I are working on so many different combinations and ideas because when it's all done, what we want is for me to say, you know what? I've used every combination of barrel length, of barrel profile, of cartridge, of, of stock, whatever. This is what... 90% of the people need if they're mostly a deer hunter. And this is what 90% of them need if they're mostly an elk hunter, and blah, blah, blah. Hopefully taking a lot of that headache out for you. But I'm sure when I'm out using them this year, people are gonna be like, what was that rifle you were using? Well, I'm here to tell you, a lot of what you're gonna see me using this year is kind of stuff we're putting together for experiments. So if you see it, it's probably an experiment. <laughs> oh, gosh. All right, Dan, what's, what's the best one we just got to do for everybody? Because we're going to wind up. We're going to, I think we get timed out at an hour with uh, Instagram, don't we? Uh, usually. So we got to thank Bowtech. We got to thank Leopold. We got to thank uh, Onyx Maps, or Onyx as we call them, uh, Tight Spot, Black Gold, Ripcord, uh, GoHunt.com, Rocky Mountain Hunting Calls. Got to thank them all for making this possible. And... What we want you to do is, if you would, go over to our YouTube channel and on these e-scouting videos we're doing, leave questions because then we can read some of those questions before we get to these and we can answer them. 
And if you're following our uh, Hunt Talk Radio podcast or our Elk Talk podcast, go and leave questions there. Uh, you can leave questions on our Instagram page, at Randy Newberg Hunter, on our Facebook page, Randy Newberg Hunter, uh, at Elk Talk Podcast. Anyhow, all these places, the more questions that you leave, we sit down and we sort through all these questions on a regular basis, and it tells us what uh, listeners and viewers are wanting. And a lot of times we read it and we're like, you know what? We just got to say we don't know. Or I guess we could make it up. But a lot of times people say, why didn't you answer my question? Uh, because we don't know. We're trying to find out. When we find out, we'll try to answer it. Um, we don't know everything. Uh, <laughs> I know so little. Everything I know is a function of how many mistakes I've made in my life. And it's a lot. And occasionally, if you make enough mistakes, something turns out right. And that's, that's really about the only reason I ever hang a tag on an elk, is through dumb luck, hard work, and a lot of mistakes. But I don't give up very easy. Very easy. Not at all. So, Dan, what do you got? You got a last one here? Yeah, I got a last one. Okay. Mike Cross says, I right. can't believe you don't use a log. <sighs> <laughs> oh, Dan read a question of a guy who watched our video that we released last Friday. Uh, go out to our, our YouTube channel. Uh, Ty Stubblefield was with us on a hunt. And when you give Ty the mic, if any of you watched him when he was back with the Born and Raised out, <clears throat> Outdoors guys, uh, Ty has no inhibitions at all. He will ask you some of the most personal questions. So we let Mike act like he was the reporter asking questions. And so this person just told Dan, I can't believe that Randy doesn't use a log. And if you go and watch the video that was released last week about how to in the woods, you'll know what he is talking about. <laughs> Anyhow, folks, thanks for watching. We're going to be here next Wednesday night, same time. I'm not going to be on the road. We got the technology. We got old Fred right here. And uh, thanks to everyone for watching. Really appreciate it.